So thank you very much uh, for all showing up again. And um, it's um, always a pleasure to be here and, and always very happy to, that you want me to speak. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. And this time I want to talk about a lifelong learning. And that really is, the, I think, the fourth part of the NLNOC work trilogy. Uh, most good trilogies have four parts. In part one, we said, well, how come my boss is such an idiot that he makes more money than I do and has a better life? How, how, how do I get some of that? And part two was, how do I get a better job or a better paying job? And three, should I even have a job? Um, you will get the PDF of these slides on the NLNOC site, and there are notes underneath with URLs to many things, including to these previous three presentations. And uh, here today, I'm talking about lifelong learning. So we first had to talk about how do I optimize my career, or should I even have a job? And this is about the daily choices that we all face. We need to do something. Am I going to do it by hand? Am I going to automate it? Am I going to script it? And am I going to use technologies that I've used for the past 25 years already? Or am I going to pick something new for a change? Or am I the kind of person that always picks something new uh, and never becomes any good at technology because I do not spend enough time with it? And you can see there's a bit of tension there in how much do I invest in learning new things and how much do I enjoy working with the things that I know already. And these are choices you make every day for every little task, for every little project. But if you add this up for over like 30 years, this sort of defines your whole professional development. Because if you keep choosing the same old stuff for 25 years, eventually it does not turn out well. Unless you are very lucky, and we get to that. Um, but if you keep picking new things and you never become any good at any particular technology, you might end up as a manager. Uh, and, but we talk about that as well. Oh. It might actually work for you. It might actually work for you. That's also part of the presentation. So I'm a sort of terrible person to ask about career management because I, I've, I've, been, I've been a researcher, I've been a sort of journalist, I've been a, a scientist, I've been a, a spy, apparently. Um, I've been a spy regulator. Um, so it, it, I'm not a good person to ask for how do I focus on my career. Um, it's like asking a drug dealer, do you know about drugs? You say, I do, but uh, well, I don't, of course. Um, uh, these days, on one sort of professional announcement, I'm on the advisory board of the Dutch Authority for Terrorism and Child Sexual Exploitation Related Material, the ATKM. If you ever feel, as an internet service provider, that the ATKM is full of shit, uh, you can talk to me, <laughs> because I can then advise them not to. Uh, this is not a joke, this is actually officially my function there. Um, so my career is, is all over the place, so, I'm, so I sort of know what I'm talking about. So, so I, I did DNA research and got that published in Nature and dot com. And um, I have a satellite monitoring network which looks super scary. And, uh, oh, and I write, write about climate change and I'm sort of a government influencer these days. <laughs> and um, so it's, it's all over the place, uh, but still I do know a little bit what I'm talking about, because for the past 35 years I've been programming in C++. I write websites in C++, <laughs> and very good ones too. And uh, I write terrible JavaScript and Python. I've been writing terrible JavaScript and Python for the past 15 years. It's still terrible. But from that you can see that in one part of my sort of career I keep doing new things, and there is another area where I said, no, this is my thing and don't touch it. This is, I'm good at this, I'm going to continue using this until it's outlawed by the Rust strike force. Um, so, the, but so I do know, so now let's, let's, let's get to the meat of the story. I even wrote a whole article in the IEEE journal how terrible modern software is. So see, but now I'm gonna tell you about change, um, the future. Um, there are two areas I want to talk about, lifelong learning technology and sort of trying different things. I'm gonna start with technology. And we get new technologies all the time. So if you've been around for a bit, you have been through various hype cycles already. Um, a particular favorite of mine is UML, which is now almost forgotten, which was an idea that managers could write sort of diagrams how the software would work, and then programmers would type that in. Uh, of course, it didn't work, but uh, it was a great sell because the managers decide what we buy, so you should always pitch it to them. 
And of course, then everything had to be in the second life. We had to be agile, blockchain, Bitcoin, 5G self-driving cars. They actually tried to sell us to that, that a few years ago. I still don't know what 5G has to do with self-driving cars, but many people apparently thought that these were very related. Uh, the digital transformation, I, I, I think it's done by now, the digital transformation. I never hear about it anymore, so they, they probably finished it. DevOps, Kubernetes, quantum computing, and of course, the big one, AI. But it's good to realize that AI is only the last in the series of technological changes that, that have been sent to us. It's, it's the biggest one, though. And of course, you may wonder, you sit there, you say, like, look, I'm just trying to do my job. I'm just trying to get the planes to land safely. Do I really have to have AI in my controller? <laughs> but the problem is, no, I, it sounds funny, but it's a real problem. I think, I think really probably one day, one point, someone's going to come down from the headquarters. For some reason, the technologists are always in the cellar somewhere, and the management is on top. And they will come down and say, why don't we have AI in here? And you go like, because we want the damn planes to land and not, and not have some sort of approximation of where the sixth runway could be. Um, but you, you all recognize, from the laughter I hear that you all recognize that you, you've had that occasion where someone goes down and says, how about we DevOps HR? <laughs> You're like, please don't. Um, so in, in a way, a technical career is this array of new technical things coming down and us having to sort of judge on that. Is this good? Is this new thing good? Is this new thing bad? Should we do it? Should we try to hide it from our management so they no longer ask about it? And uh, now the current example, and maybe the biggest one ever, is AI. Everyone has an opinion about AI. And everyone is, of course, secretly either worried that they're not doing enough AI or that they will be replaced by AI. And it's good when, evalu when thinking about evaluating new technologies to spend some time on your own feelings about this. And we'll get to that in a later slide. But I think almost everyone here will have a personal opinion on if AI is bullshit or if it's great or if you will be replaced by AI or if everyone else will be replaced by AI, except you. Um, but it's good to realize that you already have an... Is there anyone with no opinion on AI? That's <laughs> chat GPT enters the chat. <laughs> we're good, we're good. Um, so this is a diagram, and, and here you can see that I'm not good at making diagrams. Um, the big blob represents the skills that an employer needs. Those are the things that they need their uh, personnel to be able to do. And the little uh, pentagon in the middle, that's like the new employee. He's just at the beginning of their career. They're not yet very good at what they do, but what they do is smack in the middle of what the employer needs. And over time, you get more experience. You, get, you learn more things and you become better at the core of what you do. And eventually, you become very good at a number of things and you explore the area of things that you can also do, like my JavaScript skills. And, uh, and eventually, you're like nuclear grade good at some core technology. Like I'm like the best Perl programmer ever or my IPv4 skills are like out there. And, uh, and, 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 but this is quite painful because you get, you could probably, it's quite easy to go to work and know, look, I'm really good at uh, Python and I'm gonna do some more Python and I'm gon going to become even better at Python. It's a very natural thing to do. You don't have to think about it. You just go sit there and like, I'm gonna use my favorite tool to do my favorite job and I'm gonna get even better at it. And one day you come to the office and you find out uh, that you are now extremely good at things that your employer doesn't really want anymore. And this is very painful. Also psychologically, because you personally feel like I'm like really good at this stuff. I'm like the BGP king. I'm the DHCP master. And your employer says we outsourced all of the DHCP. We, we, we are no longer sure what DHCP is. And you sit there, yeah, but I'm the best at it. And this is, so this is, of course, these, these few slides represents like 20 years of career development. But this point can suddenly happen. Um, it might not be that bad. There might be other employers that are by then extremely hot for your DHCP skills. So it might end well. It might also 
turn out differently where you suddenly have to find a new job and you end somewhere in the basement. Uh, and I, do, I, I want to be sure that I am in this picture. So I am also in this picture. This is not necessarily a terrible outcome. This could definitely be that you say, look, I'm now doing the technology I love, but I used to do it as an exciting place, and now I work at the tax office. And you can find that doing Python at the tax office is just a very valuable job, and it's maybe just not as exciting as joining that internet service provider 25 years ago or that gaming platform that you used to work for. Um, but this is a case where you had a career development, but you don't, did not develop your career, your career sort of developed you. And suddenly you have a new job, uh, and you could also not have this, 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 is, this is a pretty good outcome. But once you sit here, you might suddenly be very good at a technology that everyone has decided they no longer care about. So with this, I'd like to hammer home the importance of steering your knowledge development, because you make these choices every day. Will I use Python? Will I use Go? Will I try Kubernetes for a while? Shall I go cloud native? And the interesting thing is that many of these choices are personal choices that you make behind your desk. So if you start a big new project, of course, everyone wants to figure out what technology you're going to use. But if you sit there and your task is to solve a specific problem, you have a lot of options of doing that, and it's your choice. It might be wise to think about that choice. Now, we cannot take all new things seriously. You would go batshit insane if you tried all the new JavaScript frameworks, um, or if you tried all the new orchestration platforms, or every new cloud service. You would go completely crazy if you did that. But the other way around, if you just sit there and go like, hey, I'm rocking it with Orc, um, <laughs> eventually you could rerun into problems. So you have to strike a balance and uh, there's this, this, this very wise philosopher, Schopenhauer, he's originally in German, but it's in German, it's even for German, this is hard to read. Um, but in English, he said, well, if you want to do the good things in life, you have to read the good books and not read the bad books. And you have to really make sure that you waste no time on the wrong things, because the wrong things will distract you from the right things. So you have to make a choice. And I also made that choice once. And uh, back in 2011, I said, I'm, I made a good study of Bitcoin and blockchain and stuff, and I decided I'm not going to do anything with it. And I'm not even going to do anything with people that do something with that. And that was a very wise choice. That, was, that saved me so much time, and time which I could focus on other things, and it was very good. And um, sadly, in that same year, without thinking, I decided that all this deep learning stuff was bullshit. And that was wrong. That was the wrong choice. Um, and because I thought it was all this Californian self-driving Elon Musk uh, shit, uh, it cannot be good. And that was bad. And then the people from Google, they invented the language model called BERT. <laughs> and I should have taken the hint. I should have said, well, okay, if you start naming things after me, maybe I should take another look. But uh, I did not. And it turns out they even have a field called Bertology. And <laughs> anyhow, I, I ignored all that stuff. And, uh, and I was sad because in 2020, actually, the chat GPT arrived in 2020, which is two years before anyone else realized that it arrived. In 2020, it was a Python API. So not a nice website, but with the Python API, you could already have the chat GPT experience. Now, I'm not saying that it's all good, it's definitely not all good, but it is a revolution. And it is a revolution that is something that we need to know about, that we need to study. But because I decided to just ignore all this, uh, this, this AI stuff, I didn't do it. So then to compensate, I, I wrote the whole thing, uh, deep learning from scratch, um, which might be interesting for you also to, if you want to sort of figure out what's going on. There's a link in the PDF. And this starts with an empty directory and ends up with a thing that can read my handwriting. Uh, which is beyond most people. Um, and that's all in, in, in like 2,000 lines of code. This is, uh, that's, it's sort of fun. So I made up for my little mistake there. But the key thing here is, it is good to decide that this technology is not for me, but do think about it a bit first. So this is Douglas Adams, who also wrote a five-part trilogy even. And, and he, he was not only an interesting writer, but also sort of a philosopher. And, and he came to the point that, look, anything that's invented uh, when you're born is like normal. 
And there's an area in your life between 15 and 35 that all kinds of stuff is new and you can make a career in it and you should really do it and anything invented after that is just wrong. <laughs> um, it is good to realize this, even though this is not as true as it was, there is this, I think we all recognize a little bit of, you know, yeah, this is normal and this, ah, to these young people. And, um, and this is sort of the old world. The old world, the more senior you were in a company, the more conservative you were. So this is one of the founders of computing itself, Ken Olson. Many of these quotes, if you chase them down, are not true. These ones are actually true. He actually said this. There's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Thank you, Ken. I have three computers in my pocket, <laughs> uh, as far as I know. Um, this is another one. This is serious people in the year 2000 said, well, the internet might just go away. Uh, we have a Nobel Prize winner here, Paul Krugman, in 1998, which is even a bit later, said the internet is going to peak in 2005, and by then we're going to move on. This is sort of the old world in which the more senior you were, the more conservative you were. That meant that if you had wanted to advance as a technical person, you would have to get room for it, you would have to ask permission for change and stuff. And this has now changed because we now have all kinds of managers that are like, why are we not yet into DevOps AI? I read about that. And uh, we should be cloud AI quantum blockchain native. <laughs> That's a real problem. That is a real problem that you sit there, you want to get your job done and your, your, your upper management and the shareholders, by the way, the shareholders are just behind your management and saying, look, we need to be with these uh, Tensor AI chips. And uh, this was back when Dilbert was fun and Dilbert was not an idiot. And, and this is actually very old. So this is not new. This is the manager that comes in, we need a SQL database. And Dilbert is wondering, should I ignore this guy? And he said, well, what color should it be? And it should be mauve because it has the most RAM, which clearly makes, it makes very clear the management had no idea what they were doing. And you can just safely ignore them. Uh, but this is now not a rare coincidence. This happens all the time. And the problem now is that people are even writing LinkedIn think pieces on this, that CEOs should stop chasing the shiny new thing. And they even made a graph of this. This is the official Gartner hype graph, in which they make a graph of all hype technologies. And it's interesting that they sort of jumped the shark that way, because they even say, look, this is a hype. We are made, we've made it official. So this is not a list of interesting new technologies. It is a list of the most modern hype. And we're going to update that every year. Um, it's sort of fun. This is the 2021 version, which had non-fungible tokens, NFTs on it. Okay. And, uh, but it also had like weird thing like machine readable legislation and influence engineering. And then a few years later, they, they have a whole new hype cycle. And uh, so it now lists WebAssembly, which is already sort of descending again because people wisely woke up to the idea that running software in your browser on a virtualized platform is maybe one layer too many. Um, but these are things that are very important. And from this hype cycle, we as sort of technical engineering people might eventually come to the conclusion that all this new stuff is shit. <laughs> Which is a short, it's a mental shortcut. Where you go like, look, I've seen what you came in with, with your NFTs and your blockchains and your DevOps thingies. And, uh, and from now on, I'm going to ignore all the new things. Because I have decided that 2012, maybe, was the high point of technology. Uh, or, and for, for, for everyone, will be a personal year, in which you sort of conclude, well, everything that they invent from now on is just pants. And then, some, then you end up in this career trap where you've decided that, look, my whatever JavaScript skills, they are the best, and I long, no longer care about new things. And that's a very dangerous point uh, in your career, and I think you can all, we can all recognize that point, where you go like, oh, what now? And, and that's sad, because many of us have still like 30 years of career left. It might be worth thinking a bit about it. So what do new technologies look like? Uh, the black thick line, uh, the top line, that represents your skills at a certain technology. And over time, you have become frighteningly good at your favorite technology. And then, at sort of midpoint of your career, someone shows up with something new. 
and the new shiny thing, that's the orange lower line with the arrow. And it's new, and it's out of the box, it can do many things that you spent 20 years learning. But the question is, will this new thing eventually be better than your skills or not? And frankly, we don't know. So if you're like really good with Python, and, and Go, Go comes along, and Go does some things out of the box really well, is it time to give up on Python? We, we don't know. And because it could end up like this. It could be that this new thing is actually just a lot better than what you were doing. Uh, arguably, this happened to uh, Perl and Python, where eventually Python was just so much better. And in this case, you would be wise to say, well, let's take a look at Python or whatever, as a new thing. Uh, but it might also end up like this, and this is actually far more common. Uh, some new technology comes along out of the box. It is quite capable, but it is not as capable as the thing you are good at. Uh, so, for example, if you were a C++ programmer, there are things you can do in C++ that are extremely hard to do in Go. But there are many things that are like really easy to do in Go. And eventually, you might be the best person in your chosen programming language or field, but new people are like 75% as productive as you are after only a few years of exercise. And eventually, this sort of mediocre technology takes over because it's far easier to find new employees that know this new technology than know your old technology. So as engineers we might be, the best technology should win and should always win, but very often will you get that, well, this technology is not quite as good, but lots of people understand it, so effectively it won. Something to, to think about. And then there's also this one. Um, these are the people that like, I like to do new things. And so I, I jump from language to language. I, I run from, from routing te technology to routing technology and I never get really good at anything. And this is a fun way actually to spend your career because you, you keep learning new things. It's really fun. You can get invited to all the fun conferences and, and every, it's, it's really fun, but you never really get anywhere. Nevertheless, <laughs> it could be a lot of fun. And, and, and you might end up actually, it was a little bit of a joke at the beginning, but after like 20 years of this, you might end up as an interesting manager because you have seen many different things. You've never become really good at one specific technology, but you now know many different technologies a little bit. And if you can avoid turning into this huge mansplainer um, that now says, look, I was programming in Perl, or the, anyhow, um, you know these people and some of us are these people and it, it actually does pay to stick around with a certain technology until you really uh, master it. So these are sort of the scenarios uh, with new technologies. And this is the kind of stuff that, that is coming towards us. So uh, we have uh, cloud native. Everything should, of course, right now we're in a phase where everyone says everything should always move to the cloud. Whereas the very large players are again discovering, well, well actually that's rather expensive, so maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, Kubernetes is one of these things that some people, they, they tie their shoelaces with Kubernetes, I think. And uh, they uh, do everything with it. There are some people that can no longer think if AI is not in the project. So from this slide, you can see that we have a lot to evaluate. There's a lot of technology that we need to form uh, an opinion about and and it's also good to see some of the things that we never hear about anymore like big data uh, which is sort of this mythical thing that would kind of change everything with, without us really knowing what it was uh, except the operational definition that more than 65,000 rows which didn't fit in Excel um, <laughs> but it pays attention to sort of follow the hype cycle and to form a reasoned opinion of new technologies. And especially it's important not to do that alone because that's too much work. So here I want to sort of go over a few of the changes that we've seen over time. So you can let your mind go over, well, what do I think about that? So in the olden days, we, we did everything in Orc and in Shell. And then Perl came around and then these, these, these new guys from PHP, which we all hated, but actually they made some very interesting products. Um, Python came around and then everyone, then Go was the new hotness and now people are sort of doing everything in JavaScript and I don't know why. 
uh, with 15,000 dependencies or 1,500. And there are now people that want to write scripts in Rust or Swift. And you can see that this spans sort of 20 years. And over time, with each of these things, we will have had our favorites. Or I'm not ever going to, Java isn't even on there, which is, which is an example sort of my blind spot. Because earlier in my career, when I didn't really think it through, I was like, I'm not touching Java ever. Maybe it was a good choice, I don't know. But I ignored it so much that I didn't put it on this slide. Whereas there are like millions of people that live every day in Java and actually it still sort of runs the world, I think. Um, this is also an interesting evolution. Um, yeah, I mean, it used to be that people had, had whole naming schemes for their servers and now you're some kind of idiot if you name your server. Except if you name it server one, maybe. But, <laughs> Um, and then you see that people had various, various automation, orchestration platforms, and Kubernetes, and now it has to be... F and, and this is not going to stop changing. Uh, and each time we'll have to form an opinion, like, is Kubernetes the thing forever? Uh, or should we just stop doing computers and only do services? These are choices that we have to continuously have to make, and if you make them wrong, you suddenly have no job. So it's, it's not a small thing. I love this one. And I lived through this. So I wrote a piece of software that was utterly dependent on MySQL. And every once in a while, MySQL would become extremely slow and no longer do what I wanted. And people blamed that on the database. Actually, they blamed that on the language of the database. They said, this SQL thing is all wrong. The future is no SQL. And everyone jumped on that bandwagon. and people started doing financial services on MongoDB. Um, I had a lucky experience. I was sniffing out MongoDB back when it was really small and they had an IRC channel and the founder was on there and whatever. And I found out that sometimes Mongo would just throw away half of my data. And so I asked them, I said, yeah, yeah, you should not stop the, the demon ever. You should just... I said, what? I said, no, 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 you just have to make sure that it completes the writing. I said, it's, it told me it completed the writing. Yeah, we don't actually check for that. And uh, just don't, don't ever shut it down. Okay. I was like, okay, I'm leaving this IRC channel now, and I'm, I'm washing, washing my client. And, uh, but I, what I find so very interesting about this one, this is one of the very few cases where a decade later, we are now rediscovering how incredibly good these SQL databases are. And that it was actually not their fault that they didn't do what we wanted. We just wanted some very strange things from them. And, uh, and now you see that PostgreSQL and SQLite are better than ever. They're like extremely good. And, and, and even young people are now finding out that SQL is actually a very interesting way of telling a database what you want it to do. Because it's not only key value stores. And so this is a case where, it, where the circle went round. Where the people that ignored the whole NoSQL development actually came out great. Because they're now super duper SQL experts. And, and it's all hot again. And uh, so this happens from time to time. It's not always, the new stuff doesn't always take over. Pearl is also still around. Yeah. Um. <laughs> the reason I put this on here, because almost everyone has a sort of opinion on systemd, like it's terrible, and Leonard is an idiot, and... Uh, and, and, and people went so far as to sort of fork all of Debian, which is like big work, uh, to create a system without systemd. People fled to FreeBSD, and so it's, it's, it is a big thing. But we never really got around to, there was more feelings than facts. People said, yeah, I hate systemd because I once had this well, terrible experience somewhere. Life would have been better if the community had decided to say, okay, systemd, actually there are serious quality issues in there, but let's go fix them. And that's, what, that's not what happened. We actually start, let's complain about them. And, and many people are like extremely passionate in their opinion about systemd, uh, and very often in an unjustified way, because they, they come back to, yeah, like back in 2012, I had, to, yeah, I know, uh, terrible back then. Uh, but it would have been better to focus just on the quality and instead of focusing on our opinions, but we did. Yeah, this is of course the big one. This is the one that, that we're living through right now. Um, technically speaking, many of the tasks that we do 
could feasibly be enhanced using AI. I'm not saying that it would be good, but it is definitely in the realm, should I look at this? So you have a log, all kinds of entries in the log, and you're wondering, are there any strange entries in there? AI can do that for you. If you have 5,000 trouble tickets open, and you have these, and you wonder, is there a theme in these 5,000 tickets? Is there anything big that is causing like 2,000 of these 5,000 issues? AI could tell you. But there are lots of reasons why you might not want to do that. For example, if you do it naively, it means that you would have to send all your 5,000 trouble tickets to California, where they would do then further AI on it. Um, but if you did a little, little bit more work, you could run the AI locally and benefit from it today. These are real choices where I think there are many sort of diehards that will say, uh, I should do the thinking here and not the computer. And there are other people that are saying, I cannot wait to replace all my colleagues by AI. <laughs> um, but your personal position in here is going to be very important. Because you could either figure out the good bits. And let me give, let me give you an example of the good bits. Um, if you run your own, own mail interface, you have, will have challenges with spam filtering. And sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. Spam filtering is actually extremely easy for AI to do. So if you run a large language model on your own server, and you can just ask it, is this message spam and it's probably right. You don't even have to, to learn it anything. It will just probably do that out of the box. That means that as people that do things with computers, Today, we could solve problems with AI on our computers without the cloud, without Elon Musk. Uh, it could actually do something useful. Whereas I already know that many of you are like, no, not ever going to do that. It hallucinates things. It is bad. And you might also be right at that. But if we mess this up, then a whole new generation comes along that does everything with AI, and they don't do it right. So it is on us to figure out, can we use this technology? Can the AI predict that my server will fall over at 3 a.m.? Maybe it can. Uh, I would love for my server to already announce to me that it's going to fall over at 3 a.m. <laughs> because otherwise it will announce that at 3 a.m. Um, so here you can test yourself. You sit behind your computer, there's a problem that needs solving, and you're going to either copy-paste something by hand 5,000 times, or maybe this is the time when you say, I'm going to download uh, this, this huge binary. <laughs> They're big. And, um, and see what the AI makes of it. Because it's trivial right now to download stuff and interface with it from Python and just ask the AI, do you think this message is spam or not? And your own computer will calculate that. And you can calibrate yourself on this. If you're already convinced that we'll, this, this will never be good, then, well, then you can prepare for this building here. You can go live here. Wow, that's a lot of slides, yeah. Then you can prepare for this building and say, okay, I've just shut off any new things in my life. I'm gonna work somewhere where they only do old things. And again, depending on where you are in your career, that might be a good choice. It might be that you're like, hey, I just do work and I go home, I get paid, it's fine. Uh, but make it a conscious choice. Don't just say, I'm not going to do AI because it's, it's AI and Tesla. Those are not good reasons. Um, a few other things. Technologies. I see people get extremely passionate about why certain technologies are good or bad. So people are like, yeah, ZFS this is the best thing since sliced bread. It can do no wrong. It ate my data three times, but I, it can do no wrong. And and there are people that have this relationship with C++, for example. Now, it's actually not true. I, I, I sort of, if, if, if you have a healthy relationship with technology, you love it and hate it. Because you love it because you know it can do these good things for me, and I also have a very good list of all the things that are terrible. That's a healthy relation with technology. If you find yourself just loving technology because it's, it's technology, uh, then you're actually in love. You're not actually, you're not being an engineer at that point. Um, Technologies are not football teams or musicians. Now, of course, no one here is a fan of football or, or musicians, I think, but in normal, in normal circumstances, this works. Um, but you can be a huge fan of actual open source software. 
So you could be a huge fan of uh, SQLite, for example. I am, because I've worked with their community, and their community is great. They solve your problems, they listen to you. It is okay to love SQLite. Um, <laughs> You have more, yeah, they, they also think it's okay. But, um, but it's more difficult if you love Kubernetes. Because Kubernetes is not your community, they are not your friends, there are very big commercial companies behind it. And you should look at yourself and say, why do I love this technology? What is good about this stuff? So we come here to the algorithm. Um, if you encounter a new technology, first have no opinion. Just say, okay, this new database arrived, this vector database arrived on the scene, I'm going to study it, but I'm not immediately going to form a judgment, which is difficult because our brains are effectively judgment machines. They sit there all day long saying, this is good, 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 bad, bad, good. Now, give it a rest. No, something new comes along, read about it, but try to stay neutral on it. And very important is, is, again, the role of hype. So you go to Hacker News or whatever, and everyone there says, yeah, this is the best thing since sliced bread, or it's the worst thing since Linux. Uh, however, do not get your opinions from those people. Uh, but do consider your own feelings. So for example, if you love a new piece of technology um, because it's like the other things that you love. Okay, well, so let's say you really love cloud stuff, something new cloud comes along, and you might say, hey, I'm, I like it already. I haven't really looked at it, but I like it already. Or if you're like me, I, for example, struggle, let's say Google comes up with something new in the cloud. I really have to say, okay, kind of take a look if it's good, because I'm already feeling that it's terrible. Um, but if you really take a look at it, you can find out, okay, this is actually good. This is worthwhile, even though it came from this place that I do not like. This is still the good stuff. For example, Facebook, Meta, makes some awesome technology. Uh, but if I think too much about Facebook, I would not see that. Because I would only see Facebook. Um, the other neat trick that I cannot recommend enough. If someone says, you should be using X, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Go do it. Because that is a neat trick. Because many people that are super enthusiastic about the technology, they are so enthusiastic because they've never tried it. So as Bjarne Straustrup, the inventor of C++, said, there are two kinds of programming languages, the ones that people complain about and the ones that no one uses. And so one neat trick, if someone says, you must use this new thing, okay, go do it. And you might very quickly discover that it actually sucks. And then you can go back to your friend and say, hey, I'm, I'm trying your new thing. And can you help me now? And you'll find that either they fix your problem, which is good because then you have some good technology, or you find out that they were just in love with this new technology because they hadn't actually tried it. Free trick. Um, the fifth thing is interesting. Um, I told you that it's, there is so much new technology that comes towards us, that it's a full-time job evaluating all of that. You cannot do that. However, you can go to an LNOC or, or to your own personnel, your own colleagues, and say, I'm going to present on this new database that I tried out. And I liked it because it did the following things really well, and I didn't like it because it did the following things not that well. And in that way, you can all learn from each other. And so you sort of crowdsource your, your judgment. And uh, that's good for you, and that's good for your listeners. So I would recommend anyone that if you have any kind of personnel event or go to NLNOX, just say, hey, I tried this new vector database, and this is what I make of it, and then you get audience research. So there, together you can form an opinion on new things. So we're quickly running out of time. So I want to mention one completely different thing. We now spoke about technology, which means becoming an ever better engineer. Uh, but there are other things in engineering, it, it turns out. <laughs> um, if you ever get the opportunity within your organization or company or hobby or volunteer work, whatever, to do something completely different, I really recommend that. I put that in bold, customer support. You will never understand customers unless you've spent time helping them. And even if you have spent time helping them, it doesn't mean that you will from that point <laughs> understand all of it because it's... <laughs> I, so the people that have done customer support know what I'm talking about. 
Uh, but it's really, I can guarantee you, if you have not done any customer support in a help desk or ticket, or you will not understand what is happening outside the world. So do not only focus on engineering. If you have any chance to broaden your scope, please do it. Because the interesting thing is, let's say you're like a super duper programmer, a SQL guy, and this is how good you are at many things. And now you do an interesting, look at the programming bar. It just says, okay, you're 25 programmer, whatever. Now you've done some other work and suddenly you've turned into C++, okay? Um, but you are now also a better programmer. How does that work? Previously, when you programmed stuff, you did maybe not have a good model of that people divorce or die or move or whatever. Um, and that means that in your programming, you will also not have me taken measures so that you can support a family divorcing. Uh, because you've never thought about that. And um, so it turns out that if you broaden your scope, you become better at everything. Because you have a better picture of what could go wrong or uh, that what would happen if normal people use your product. Um, it is really worthwhile to not just only focus on technology, but also learn something really weird, like participate in the rebuilding project of your organization or if HR has a role of, I don't know, developer, ambassador, do that for a while. You will learn so much and it will even turn you into a better engineer. Uh, well, this is sort of the HR view of the world. Uh, you can only achieve true greatness if you focus on one thing. And I have to say that people that are in personnel departments, they really love this stuff because they want to have their employee type such and such and they can do the following three things which works really well for them. But it turns out that if you learn many different things, you get a whole new uh, view on life. And that prevents you from ending up in this comic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this happens a lot. Uh, where you just become a super duper engineer and then we say, you're so good with computers, we're gonna make you a manager now. And we're not gonna help you with that, actually. We're just going to assume that you can transform all these computing skills into management skills. And both of the chairs in this comic are a terrible place to be. Uh, because you don't ever want to hear this, and you don't ever want to tell someone that. Look, we have no career path for you. But if you broadened yourself sufficiently in the course of your career, you would not end up here because you might be better prepared for a different role in the company elsewhere. So. If you ever get the opportunity to do something non-technical, then I would recommend doing it. Briefly, some of you are managers. You can raise your hand if you are. Yeah, yeah, very brave, very brave. Um, <laughs> no, but, but management actually is like super important and not easy, and I'm not here to make fun of management. Um, but you have an, a very important role. If you go like, look, this, all, the, all our projects need to be on time. So we're gonna do all our projects the way we've always done them. We're gonna use this database, we're gonna use that platform, we're gonna use that website. Then you should not be uh, amazed that no innovation happens in your company. That people will only learn and try new things if you give them time for that. And if you visibly appreciate it. And if you have not wasted their time with the quantum blockchain. Uh, because if you have people chasing these new things, they, they're like, okay, you just want shiny new things. You don't actually want me to improve. Um, so it's very important if you are in any kind of management to visibly support people doing new things. And also if the new thing fails, uh, turn it into a, a learning experience. Have people do a presentation on it. We tried MongoDB and it, it ate all our financials. And, um, but share that news. And then the manager should like visibly come up to the stage and you cannot be ridiculous enough about this. You can go, just go on stage and say, I'm so happy that this failed. And then continue applauding until everyone believes that you actually, actually are happy that it failed. And of course you aren't happy that it failed, but uh, it should be very clear that we want you to continue to innovate and try new things. And, and not make jokes about, yeah, haha, that's the last time we did that. Uh, because then no one is going to learn anything. And um, the last two bullet points are about valuing and rewarding. Um, if you have an employee that did something new, then 
and if you have a bonus or a whatever salary scale, award them for it. Because nothing speaks louder than actually paying people for improving. This is often forgotten in the Netherlands, so I put it in bold. <laughs> so, we're nearly done. Um, lifelong learning, it's, that doesn't mean that you have to be going training courses all day long. Um, don't just like or hate new things. If something new comes along, give yourself the time to study it. Study it together with colleagues, present about it, because um, if you disregard this, eventually your, your company will have moved away from you and you will have decided that no new technology after 2015 was any good. And that's a bad place to be in. Um, if you ever get the opportunity to do something really new, by all means do it, even if it means spending like a few months with the help desk, especially if it means spending a few months with the help desk. The other thing is, if you work in an environment where you know that they do not appreciate you doing new things, then you don't have to feel bad about not wanting to do new things. Because you are not stimulated to do new things and you will realize that uh, your management will only get mad at you if you try new things. And that means that you will have to try the new things at home or at your hobby, at an LNOC maybe, and eventually find a new job. But then, I cannot stress this enough, the choices you make about the technologies you use over the decades are career defining. And therefore it is quite sad that we just sit there and think like, ooh, system D, bad. No, it should be like, I thought long and hard about it and system D, bad. <laughs> <laughs> nah, maybe not, maybe not. But at least, at least think about it. And with that, good luck and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bert. Uh, we have time for two short questions. Julia. You mentioned large language models yeah. and that we should perhaps look at them. Given that they are essentially grand theft autocorrect at this stage... No, you, can just, you can just stop right now. You took the mental shortcut, which I warned about. You said, ah, I'm, I'm not considering this because there are ethics and I've decided they are bad. That I need actually, not be the case. I have an actual question ah. on that, though. <laughs> How do we do this in an ethical way? Well, you're not slaughtering children by running a Python program. <laughs> Maybe good to realize that. I'm um, doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not. No, you're actually not. You're executing a Python program on your own computer, and you're not ripping off an artist or whatever. If that's that's why I was quite careful in saying what I did. If you say I'm going to do my AI through OpenAI as a cloud service, then you are complicit in their data model, they are learning from your company, you are making choices based on other people's data. But there are these fabulous models that you can just download on your own computer, they are self-contained. You could even train them on your own materials. So there are various ways in which this could be good. And I would urge, and I'm sorry that I was a bit harsh, but mm -hmm. I would urge people not to make the, these mental shortcuts uh, to disregard whole fields of technologies. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will phrase it. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I, I will phrase this in AI terms because it's funny. Basically, you are describing an exploration exploitation trade off here in AI terms or a multi armed bandit problem. You need to try new things, you also need to do stuff that your employer actually wants you to do. How do you balance that? How, how do you focus enough on, the new, on, the, on, the, on your own development when your work week is like this? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. The, the one thing is, I fully appreciate that if you have a busy job, then that takes all the energy. So you cannot say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna spend like another five hours on my computer at home. Uh, so you do not have infinite time to spend. Uh, one reason because of this, I, I stressed do this with colleagues. So not everyone can study everything, but if you are in a group of 20 people, you can probably get one person to look at something for a bit, and maybe later another person looks at it, and then share that information. Because we do not all need to make a personal evaluation of everything, we just need to make sure that enough brain cycles are spent on it, and that we can share the results. And NLNOC is, by the way, a wonderful place uh, for presenting about new things that you tried, and then 250 people learn about that.
Does that answer your question? <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a better answer than I had myself, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you again, Bert.